Hello and welcome to Talking Books at Hay Festival here in Wales. I'm George Alagaya. Every year the festival brings together writers, policy makers, thinkers and artists, all of them to stimulate debate. Today I'll be talking to Fatima Bhutto, conflict and controversy coming as she does from a high profile political dynasty in Pakistan. Her latest book, The Runaways, follows the story of three young people and asks why each of them from very different backgrounds ends up joining the jihadi cause. Now, the thing about journalism, wherever you do it, is that you can do the how it happened, the when it happened, the who did it, yeah. if you like, um, there's CCTV cameras, there's all of that. But there's one question that um, journalists find much more difficult, and that is the why. Yeah. And um, I'm happy to say that my guest today, Fatima Bhutto, um, that's a question she's tried to answer in her latest book, uh, The Runaways. Um, it follows a number of young people who come from very different backgrounds, but all of them end up in the same place, uh -huh. um, associated with the jihadi cause, if I can put it that way. Uh -huh. And run in The Runaways, uh, Fatima explores what happens, what goes on in their minds, what drives them towards this thing. So Fatima, welcome. Thank you. I said there are a number of characters, they're all young people from very different backgrounds. I wonder yeah. if you talked about them a little bit, introduce us to these characters. Yes, well, the, the Runaways follows several characters, but the ones that you meet immediately in the book are Sunny, who is born to an Indian origin family, um, but grows up in, in Portsmouth. And Sunny's father left Lucknow to give his son a, a better life in England. And Sonny doesn't quite see it as a better life. He doesn't really belong in Portsmouth. And he's constantly being made to feel as though he, he, he belongs somewhere else. He just doesn't know where that place might be. And then there is Monty, who lives in Karachi in Pakistan, in, in my city. And Monty's father is an industrialist. His parents are incredibly wealthy. He goes to an American school, he lives in the best neighborhood, and Monty has no real reason to question the world around him and all his privilege until he meets a young woman in his last year of school. And then there's Anita Rose, who also lives in Karachi, but on the other side of the city. She lives in Machar Colony, which is one of the largest slum settlements um, in Karachi. And her mother is a single mother, she's a, a Malishwali, which means that she goes round to the houses of rich women to massage their very tired bodies. And Anita Rose is cut out of her city. Um, she is cast out to the periphery. And so those are the three main characters, but as the story progresses, others come along with Good. them. Good, so you know you've got rich versus poor, you've got east versus west. I mean, we'll explore all of this. Yeah. Um, I'm interested in this character, Sonny, actually, not least because he's from Portsmouth and that's where I went to school. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> and I wonder if you would just read, there is a passage yes. there dis, dis, that describes Portsmouth and, and what it is that, that Sonny uh, is running away from. Yes. Sonny went for long walks circling Portsmouth, trying to find refuge in what appeared to him to be only a wasteland, a town of forgotten people. Why hadn't Pa stayed in India with his own people where they might have belonged? Why hadn't he stayed with that friend of his, Nur Muhammad, who Sunny had to hear about all the time instead of coming here where there were nobodies? Sunny walked everywhere, kilometers along the muggy South Sea seafront, around the modern glass university buildings betrayed by the shabbiness of their designs, and even around Fratton Park, where the Islamic-looking Pompeii flag, star and crescent moon, was pasted confidently from every windowpane and shop. 
After a home game, the streets around the stadium were littered with greasy tissues dropped from burger trucks and cans of 1664 lager spilled out of the bins, like teenage bedroom drawers stuffed too quickly and shut. Cops in bright yellow fluoro vests walked behind the closed streets, the clip-clop of their horses not far behind. Men with pot bellies and closely cropped salt and pepper hair, aquamarine tattoos, fuzzy and out of focus, the ink bleeding on their sun-grizzled skin, leaned into you as you walked by. Extra tickets, they both solicited and offered. Extra tickets, extra tickets. Sonny dug his hands into his jacket pocket and kept his eyes on the tarmac, the tingling at the back of his throat itching for a fight, and the anxiety in his chest, desperate to avoid it. How long must a man walk through this city with no armor? His body was a naked wound in those days, and his heart beat ferociously beneath his breast. So aware was he of being unprotected, so alone and so afraid. On the curb, yellow and orange clumps of vomit clung to the grass. Thank you. Apologies to Portsmouth, but <laughs> <laughs> that's, so, that, that's after a football game, if it, <laughs> if it helps. So this is interesting because you've got apparently young men who are English in, in lots and lots of ways, you know, playing cricket and so on, and yet they feel alienated. And Sonny's one of those, isn't he, Sonny? He, he's yeah. in the place, but he's not of the place. How does that happen? I think it happens everywhere. It happens in the dehumanizing way in which we treat anyone who seems foreign or other. Um, I, you know, there, there was a, a story in the New York Times just a, a while back about a lot of these young women and children who are, who are left in these camps in Syria. And the headline was, is an ISIS child a child or a time bomb? Now, how can a child be a time bomb? And it, it feels increasingly that it's only Muslim children that can be described as time bombs. Or it might be brown uh, bodies or, or... Except, I just want to take yeah. it back because I, this is Sonny himself yeah. who's telling himself that he, he does not really belong, isn't it? Rather than the well, West saying to Sonny, hey, you're an outsider. I mean, there may be a bit of that. There, are, there is quite a bit of that yeah. <laughs> before. So Sonny is born in Britain, he is educated in Britain, and he feels British. But he's constantly being reminded and lectured of what it means to be British, as though he might not know. Um, and on the one hand, his father, who has migrated over, is desperate to fit in and wants very much to be a part of the fabric. And Sunny feels constantly pushed further and further and further and further away. And I think it's an experience of not one wound or one humiliation, but hundreds of humiliations. And I, even I feel that. I mean, I'm not a migrant, but I, I travel a lot in the world. And I feel increasingly wounded, actually, in the way in which people will talk about the world in front of me. Let, let me come on to that. It's very interesting. Yeah. I will come on to that. Um, so there's Sunny. He, mm -hmm. he, he doesn't feel he belongs. Mm -hmm. But then there's Anita, who, as yeah. you said earlier, um, lives in, 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 in the slums mm -hmm. in Karachi. She too doesn't belong. I mean, she's in her own country. You know, she's of the soil. Yes. And yet she doesn't belong. What, what, what's driving her? Well, I think The Runaways, to me, is a book set upon a backdrop of ferocious inequality, of, of burning inequality. And when we talk about radicalism, somehow that inequality never really factors into the conversation. And Anita Rose, for me, was a way of, of talking about how specific instances of powerlessness, and they, they, they are not only political, they might be economic, can aggravate and, and weaponize feelings of, of being an outsider. During the times of the Raj, Karachi was divided into white town and black town. And that's what they called it. The white town was where the, the Raj administrators lived, with the wide avenues and the banyan trees. and the water and all the rest of that. And then the black towns were where all the natives lived. And those were crowded and dislocated and cut off. And Karachi is a city still like that today. So Anita Rose does not live in the part of town where you have lights, or you have running water, or you have clean water. She's very much on the edge of that. And on the edge of that is a young girl wanting to belong, but never being allowed the space. Okay. 
So let's go back to what you just said, yeah. because I'm finding it hard to accept that you can feel an outsider. I mean, you, for all oh. for all I see, you know, oh. you're a woman who's incredibly comfortable with herself and the world. You've got a slight American accent. I mean, there must be many places <laughs> you feel at home. Well, I'll tell you this. I was born in Kabul. I grew up in Damascus, and I've got a Pakistani passport. So you haven't lived life until you've been with me at an airport. Um, and it doesn't matter where I was educated or what my accent is. The moment there's a checkpoint or a border, that's it. I'm suspect. And um, I actually had this experience of being at an airport. I won't say which one. Very recently, just after The Runaways came out. And I was asked, what do you do? And I said, I'm a writer. And I was asked, do your books advocate violence? And I thought, why are you asking me that? And the only reason I can think of is because of where I come from. OK. Do you think um, your characters, are they running away, as the title says, yeah. running away from something? Yeah. Or are they running to something? I think it's both. I think, I think it's both. I think in the case, let's say, of Sunny, he is running away from something. But at the same time, um, the reason that young people, I think, are drawn to those kind of radical movements is not because those young people are backwards. And it's, it's not because they're violent or retrogressive. It's because the message is designed to be seductive. It says to people who don't fit in, we have a world that you will be kings of. You know, you don't fit in there. They don't want you there. We want you and we need you. And here you will not only belong, but you will have power. I mean, of course, that's a lie. That's as much a lie as anything else. But I think it's a very seductive message. I think people are running away and towards something at the same time. When you say they're running to something, what I find interesting about that is you might think, mm. because they're running towards a, a, a supposedly Islamist cause, yeah. that this was something about, about faith, perhaps, about belief. Yeah. But actually, it struck me reading through the runaways, that it's, it's more of an infatuation hmm. rather than faith. Would, would, is yeah, that fair? I think that's very fair. I really don't think radicalism has anything to do with, with religion. And if we look even at the real world, a lot of the most recent runaways, by their own admission, know nothing about Islam. They have no actual grounding or study in Islam. Um, so it's a bait and switch. I mean, it, religion is always the reason given. but. You know, there was a, a set of leaked Daesh documents um, that found that they had assessed their, their recruits, and they found that 70% of them had a basic or below understanding of religion. I mean, that's an incredible number. And, and, and one of the other characters, the, the richer of the two Karachi characters, yeah. um, again, with him, it, it's not really faith or belief that takes him no. um, to Iraq. No. I think um, Monty, Monty has no question, against, he, has no, he has no battle against the world. He understands there is something profoundly unequal and unfair about the way in which he lives. But the way in which he chooses to question it is wrong. Um, but he has no religious background. He has no um, desire to go and fight. He is seduced, really into going out. Can we just look at Monty's life, actually? Because I think um, we concentrate on Sonny yep. and this idea that he couldn't belong yeah. and that somehow Britain is a divided country and Sonny is part of the have-nots. But yeah. it's clear, actually, that, that Monty, when he needs to go to the poor part of town, he, he has no idea how to get there kind of thing. Do you want yeah. to read yes. that bit? So this is where Monty is going to look for Leila, another character, on the other end of the city. He'd never driven Layla home, always dropped her off at school and handed her a hundred rupees to catch a rickshaw <clears> back. <throat> the dirty, cramped streets were alien to him, and every gully was teeming with apartment buildings, crowding each other for space as they rose messily into the sky. He thought Gulshan would look like his neighborhood, <laughs> tidy bungalows with nameplates outside every home. But Monty had never been that far into Karachi before. He kept his eyes on the road, careful not to meet the glances of men who bent down to peer into his silver Audi, staining the windows with their greasy fingerprints. Right. So you can have 
these two sides, even even in in a place like like Pakistan. Oh, now hmm. I think I think Pakistan is a country filled with those collisions. Okay, well, which is why actually, I, and this is going to sound personal in a sense okay. it is, but yeah. I think I have to ask you. Yeah, might not. Hmm some of the characters in this book, the, mm. the ones in Pakistan, mm. point the finger at you, Fatima, and mm. say, well, actually, your family mm. is part of the problem, or people like you. Well, well Monty's life is a life I know very well, because I was born into the same privilege as Monty, and I did live in a house with running water and with electricity and with high gates and high walls. But at the same time as that was true, I was also raised by a father who taught me to throw rocks at those walls and to question them. And so I would say that, yes, there are parts of my family that are a problem, parts of which exacerbated the inequality of the country. And I would also say that there are members of my family that didn't, that imagined something more just and more equal for the country. How difficult is it for you to talk about your family in these terms? And we should say, I mean, mm. your, your aunt was Benazir Bhutto, who was prime mm. minister. Your grandfather mm -hmm. was president of the country. Mm -hmm. I mean, it is a, a, a family that has seen huge conflict mm -hmm. um, and suffering. How difficult is it for you to talk about it? Well, it is difficult, but I think it's urgent also to talk about it. I think it's impossible to live in a young country like Pakistan and not acknowledge um, not just the dreams that we have as a country but also the failures and, and the lessons of those failures. My, my experience of it is slightly unusual, I suppose, because I, didn't, I grew up in Syria. So I did have a part of my life that had nothing to do with my family and where my family wasn't a shadow, always there. But you, you've written about, I think, in the songs of Blood and, and Sword, mm -hmm. and um, so I, I imagine you'd say you were being very honest in it. Other people mm -hmm. have found that book very problematic in the way it yeah. kind of points fingers. And I was, yeah. I was looking at a review, Dalrymple, William Dalrymple, famous man. I mm. mean, he, he called it an act of literary vengeance. Mm. Well, I think that's interesting because I wrote Songs of Blood and Sword about my father's assassination. And my father was killed outside of our home. So I wrote about that. Now, the men who I believe killed my father and who, by their own admission, were standing on the road are in positions of power today. They have led police, commission, uh, police reforms, commissions on police reforms. They have been elected to federal office. They have been elected to the... Well, not even elected. They have placed themselves in the highest office of the land. So I understand that they would be uncomfortable with the subject of Songs of Blood and Sword, okay. because it certainly points a finger. But for me, Songs of Blood and Sword is a book about justice in a place where you have none. Does it give you the authority to write a book like The Runaways, to be able to say, I know about what's wrong with my country and I know what people, why people might run away from it? I don't, I don't really ascribe to the idea that I have any authority for anything because I think part of what is important to me as a writer and as a person is the fact that I'm always learning. And the experience of living in the world is one of always watching it and, and understanding that there are huge spaces we know nothing about. And so as a writer, my interest is always in trying to go into those spaces and see how much I don't know. So I wouldn't say my family gives me any authority, certainly not. And I wouldn't even say my experience of violence gives me any authority. Um, the only authority I have is one of an observer, and one that, like everyone else, is a witness. All right. So let's go back to the runaways. I mean, so this is uh, about people attracted to a movement which presumably is telling people that um, they're going to take Islam back to its, its purest form. But mm. what's... I mean, The Runaways is kind of littered with mm. examples of these jihadists. Mm. 
using the most modern techniques. I mean, yeah. I'm talking social media, there's live leaks. I, mean, I, was, I was actually tempted to try out some of these things, and I thought, oh, my God, <laughs> MI5 might be watching me, you know. No, but live leak, uh, but, li you uh, can look at live leaks. Can like, I? Oh, yeah. I? I did that, just I thought, oh, well, I better be careful. <laughs> but but, but it's, it's interesting how, yeah. how, how they, they've mastered this, isn't it? Well, what's really interesting to me, George, is that if we look at radical movements or terror movements 20 years ago, they operated under the cover of secrecy, under the cover of darkness. Um, and of course, radical movements today uh, hate things like privacy because they're interested in what millennials everywhere are interested in, which is fame and celebrity and virality and being seen. And actually, Live Leak, which is uh, something I write about in the book, is like a YouTube, basically. It's just a kind of alternative YouTube. So they've got like panda videos, you know, right. and like kittens sneezing. And then they have videos of Chechnya and Syria and Iraq. Given that it's such a powerful tool for, for these people, I mean, can you ban it? Can, you know, there are attempts, aren't there, in various countries, they try and stop Snapchat or they try and stop these things. Well, what, how can you? I mean, in the case of Sri Lanka, which you mentioned, they had a blanket ban on social yeah. media right after the attacks, but it's, it's too late, isn't it? Yeah. Um, the way, the speed at which information travels cannot be unplugged anymore. How do you stop WhatsApp? How do you stop Twitter? And when does that cross over into censorship? Exactly. I think that's a very uncomfortable issue. And also, I think that the things they think that you might stop that have an effect don't. Because for me, it's seeing that New York Times headline that calls a child a bomb. That, for me, is far more radicalizing than you know a, a WikiLeaks video. Does The Runaways, do you think, having written The Runaways, mm. explain the, the question I put at the, at the, at the beginning, hmm. what drove these people to such acts? Well, I don't think it can ever fully explain a book that's too much pressure to put on one book. But I think what I hope The Runaways does is say that there are certain things we don't understand about radicalism or, in fact, the radicalized. And that main thing for me is that it's not about religion, actually. It's about isolation. It's about alienation. It's about fear. And it's about pain in a lot of cases. And if we're not looking at where the pain is, I don't think we're going to get any closer um, to pulling back generations of young people from falling down this trap. So the good news is that radicalization is not about religion. But the bad news is that many, many, many more people are vulnerable to it than we think. OK. Ladies and gentlemen, Fatima Bhutto.